The armor that God has given us is not only for defending against the enemy, but for attacking the enemy for good reason. We are to face the enemy. We are not to gaze at him from a position of safety as Saul and his array of generals, ministers, and priests did. Instead, we are to march into Elah and engage the enemy as David did. We are commissioned by God to engage the enemy in his territory with the sword of truth. We are to bring and proclaim this truth to all. We are at war and we are called to enter it. We must understand the need to prepare for battle. David did indeed march into Elah with faith. He also marched in with the weapon he prepared with. So too, God wishes us to be prepared for a war that is intensifying, where there is chaos and confusion everywhere. God's word in Ephesians describes the war we are in and how to prepare for it. There's so much more than putting on the armor of God. Join us as we study Ephesians with hearts of servant warriors in service to a victorious king. Um, I would also ask, as you're keeping those people in prayer, um, my cousin Derica and her husband Kevin, keep them in prayer. So we had my grandma pass on October 4th. She went home to be the Lord. And then Kevin is her husband. So got, uh, Gary is his name, the, uh, Kevin's dad. He passed this evening. So, yeah, so that's back to back. A lot going on. <clears throat> All right. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I don't think we're going to finish 3 today. I think this might be a two-parter. Uh, the title is... Oh, there's a connecting verses. Put up here for a minute. The title is Living in the Power and Love of Jesus Christ. All right. Let's pray. Let's get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you're doing, all you're providing. Pray that you would uh, speak this to your word. Help me to convey the message you have. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. It has been a very long week for me. So I don't if some of you may have heard or uh I was in the airport on Tuesday. It was a very long day. Um all the flights got jacked up. So I originally the plan was I was in Charlotte, Michigan. The plan was get to Detroit. It's about a two hour drive. I had someone take me down there. I was like, all right, got there at three thirty, gonna be on the plane by eight twenty, sleep on the plane, land by ten thirty come home, take a nap, and then me and the wife are going to go out to dinner. And I started to notice there were way more people that morning than were supposed to be there. And it turned out the night before, one of the flights had to come back that was on its way to Chicago, and uh, or was on its way to San Diego, excuse me, got to Chicago area and had to turn around back to Detroit. So they got canceled I don't, they said the weather, but I don't know. And um, so then all of them were pouring on the plane. And so <laughs> we're kind of like, I'm like there. And I'm like, all right, maybe get on, maybe we won't, maybe get on. And finally I got up there and they're like, what's your name? And I get my name. They're like, oh yeah, I got you right here. All right, you're clear to board, sir. And I was like, oh, thank you. Lord. Yes. Because I was, I was texting the Joshua's 3.30 their time. And I had already been to the airport and I'd already been up for 24 hours at that point. And then they were like, oh, sorry, sir. We read your last name wrong. It's the lady behind you's last name. She gets to go. And I was like, ah. Oh. So I'm tired. I'm just like, I about had it. And I'm like, okay, all right, cool. So I go, what do I do? And they go, go over to this help desk to help you out. So the lady, she's looking every which way, how to get me home. And she's looking into every possibility and and she's like, well, sir, there's a 1230 flight out of here. But she goes, there's a strong chance you're not going to be on it because the leftover people that couldn't get on this flight are going on that one, too. 
And so but she's like, let me see, let me see. She was very kind and she took about 20 minutes and she's like, maybe we can take you through Salt Lake City. Maybe we can send you through Nashville. She's like, would you be willing to go to Atlanta? And I was like, no, there's a hurricane coming. I'm really going to get stuck if I end up in Atlanta. So I was like, don't send me Southeast, you know, because they were like, what about Miami? <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> the Miami flight is completely open. So <laughs> At that point, I might as well just go to Puerto Rico. So, so they tried and tried, and there was nothing. So she's like, you're just going to have to see what you can do with the 1230. Got over to the 1230 flight. And um, I knew right away. I saw what they were doing. And right away, it said zero seats available. So I was like, oh, this isn't going to happen. And so it was me and another guy waiting. And then this lady, she was very unfriendly. Not nice. Not nice lady. And uh, so as we're waiting, this young lady runs up. She's like, hold, can you hold the door, ma'am? She's like, the New York flights were can't, were delayed massively. Like a bunch of people from New York were missing their flights. And so it's like, imagine these are the doors and the girl's like right here by the table. And she can pretend like she didn't hear and just closed it. And was just like, I was like, wow. I was like, well, so she got rude to me. And I said, well, ma'am, uh, so what do I do now? And she goes, I don't know. You figure it out. That's what she told me. So then she got lippy with the guy behind me, not knowing he's a captain's mate. He's a pilot. So he was like, well, I'll be right back. And he went and found her boss. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then he came back and he's like, here, come with me. We're going to figure this out. So the reality is, is I got on the third flight. Uh, because of all the craziness, there was like, it was 30 empty seats. And so they got everybody on there, need to get on there. Me and the, the, the cat's mate got on there. And then I, I landed at 6.50 our time. So by the time I had gotten home, I had been up for 48 hours. So, so yeah, I'm, <laughs> that was something else, man. Oh, it was crazy, 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 crazy. And you know, the thing is, if you're traveling with something, somebody and you have your, I had only two carry-ons. I had no luggage, so I didn't have to worry about that. Some people had luggage. It was already waiting for them in San Diego. I had two carry-ons. So when you travel with somebody, it's a little easier because you can be like, all right, cool. We're going to be here. I'll go get something to eat. You stay with the stuff. Or let's go together. But And then I'm going to go walk around, stretch my legs, and then, and then we'll swap out, right? So, But has anybody been to the Detroit airport? Okay. That thing is huge. Yes, it is. Massive. They have one big building just for Delta, one big building for Southwest. So it starts Alpha 1 for the first gate all the way to Alpha 80. And so I started with Alpha 18, had to go to Alpha 56, and then Alpha 74 at the end. You have to take a train. So the train's just taking you, and or it's a workout because you're walking the whole thing. And it's so big, there's a hotel in there. So I told my wife, I was like, Joseph's trying to figure things out. I'm like, Joseph's freaking out more than me a little bit. And then I'm like, and so I think it's because Joseph knew he had to teach today if I wasn't going to be here. And um, so, and so I told my wife, I said, like, the good news is there's a hotel in this place. So if I don't catch this flight, I am buying a ticket ASAP and going straight to the hotel. And then we'll figure this out in the morning. But I'm not playing this game anymore of the waiting game with them trying to take care of stuff so but i made it home i made it home it was good yeah i think the pilot was a rookie too because he came in hard into san diego and banked it really hard to the left <laughs> i laughed man people were like <gasps> i'm like oh yeah <laughs> and then it turned it hard i was like whoa i was like what do we think we see up a honduras so all right now enough of that let's keep moving yeah, it was fun. It's the most fun airport I never want to have again. All right. Other than that, everything went well. Um, my grandma held on till my mom showed up. So um, my brother rushed from Wheaton, Illinois to Milwaukee, got my mom, rushed through the Chicago traffic, and got her there by 1030. And by 330 in the morning, my grandma went home to be with the Lord. So that day was rough too because it was like wake up, go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep. We were unsure of what was going to happen. 
about holding on to things. So, and then my aunt knew a lot of us weren't going to be able to come back in time. So the memorial went Monday. So it was like fast. And on top of that, um, she was cremated. So by, by five 30, 550, the people were there to get her. She was gone. And my poor mom, man, she was, she was so beat up. So I had called her and I said, Hey, uh, grandma passed you. You want me to come get you to say goodbye? Cause I said, they're coming quick to get the body. And she's like, she could, her body was all messed up. She's like, I can't cause if you guys are not aware my mom's, she's, she's going to go too pretty soon. So, um, so she, in the morning when she got there, she's like, where's grandma? And we were like, she's gone. So I was like, they came fast. So, but it was, it was, uh, that week felt like a month is what it felt like. So it was a lot of taking care of stuff. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the cards and the condolences and everything. She's home with the Lord and she's doing better. She was going to be, uh, 89 at the end of this month. Yeah. She was born in 1935. So, yeah. So all righty, let's get started. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21. Let me read it. It says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with his might through the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and the depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right. I don't think we're going to get through the whole thing here, but uh, it's probably going to be a two-parter. There's a few points I want to make. So starting off right away, I finally know what that is too. You're fine. Don't need to be sorry. Mike told me. Mike pulled me aside and like, stop messing with Mo before I smack you. And I was like, Mike. No, I was kidding. That never happened. He just told me what it was. No. All right. So the first thing we want to look at is the fact that we long to belong. We want to belong, right? We long to belong to a family. All of us. Nobody likes being rejected. Anyone in this room like being rejected? If you raise your hand, you're a liar. All right. <laughs> Nobody likes being rejected. Nobody guys in, in love with a girl and says, I'm going to propose, bro. Oh, yeah, you are. How are you going to do it? Well, you know, I'm thinking down by the beach and, and uh, you know, there's a little picnic set up and, and we'll propose and hope that it goes well. Right. Nobody wants to get rejected. In fact, I heard one guy put it like this. It's a true story. So he, <laughs> he got a hot air balloon and I've never been in a hot air balloon. Anyone else been in a hot air balloon? I don't know how long it takes to go up, but he's in a hot air balloon. And in his mind, he thought the basket would be a little bigger. And there's the guy controlling the balloon. So he kind of just stands there and he's like, and does, you know, does his thing. And they're going up and they got to the altitude. And he thought about all these things he wanted to say to her. And, and uh, then he realized the basket's kind of small to get on one knee. So he kind of can't. And uh, he... He says he's got this romantic thing he was saying. It kind of comes out wrong. And he proposes and, and the guy's just there like, you know, working the thing. And, uh, and, the, and the girl said, yes. And all of a sudden the guy goes, whew, that's good to hear. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, oh, the last couple came up. She said no. So we were stuck up here for like an hour and they were just <laughs> looking out the opposite ends of the basket. And I was just like. Like pulling everything to get down fast, like, but can't come down too fast. He said it was an awkward time. We, we don't want to be rejected, right? We want everything to go well. 
right? We want to belong to family. We want to belong to friends. This is why people, if they don't know Jesus, they get involved in their things. I mean, think about it. You join the military. They talk about it's a brotherhood, all this stuff. And, and the recruiter promises you that it's family and brotherhood and they got your back and rah, 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 rah. And then your DI is kicking you in the face and you're like, he's not a good big brother. So <laughs> it's just things like that. Wow, nobody found that funny. All right. <laughs> Only me. All right. It's just, it's bad. It is why people join gangs because they want to belong to something. They want to feel like they belong. This is why people can get duped into cults, all right? Because cults, sometimes they make it look like family and then it's not. And the problem with cults is they're so good at it, they can almost look like the real deal to that stuff. But they're cults, right? So what I mean by that is this. They don't teach the word of God. They don't teach Jesus. They don't teach the truth. And, and everything's like you belong and, and they try to get you away from everything, all right? So, for example, when Joseph first came to know Christ, he was really excited. And he said to me, man, how come we can't just live out at a campsite and learn the Bible? And I said, because that's a cult, all right? <laughs> if you go out for a weekend, men, for a men's retreat, that's a church. You go out to live, that's a cult. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right? So... That people get sucked into this stuff, but we want to belong. The second thing is Paul's prayer for the church here and the family of God is that we would understand what God has given us, what God has given us, and that we would apply it to our lives. That's the key. A lot of times we don't understand what God has literally given you or how to apply it, okay? I want you to think about that. What God has given, how you apply it. It's like inheriting something. It's like inheriting whether it's a set of golf clubs, inheriting baseball equipment, a gun, a hunting rifle, a sphere, uh, it's not a sphere, a spear, um, bow and arrow, whatever it is, you inherit something, but if you don't know how to apply it, it does absolutely nothing for you. You can inherit a mass inheritance of $5 million. You would be ecstatic, excited, Everyone in this room, if you found out tonight that, heaven forbid, someone in your family died, but they say in your will, and to Anita, I give $5 million. Anita and Ronnie would be like, woohoo, right? Excited, all right? Now, the problem is, whether it's Anita and Ronnie getting $5 million, whether it's Dennis getting $5 million, myself, or if all of a sudden... It turned out that Lance had some uncle that he never knew left him a $10 million home and $5 million cash. He would be super excited, right? Super excited. Do you see how all of you got excited? The problem is if you don't know what to do with it, how quickly will you lose it? Quickly. This is why when people win the lottery and they're like, what's the lotto up to? Oh, the lotto's up to $80 million and they win it. And then they go, I've quit my job and I'm done. And you find out in one year they went bankrupt because they went crazy with the money. They don't know how to apply anything about uh, wisdom, strategy, what's important with money. Quit your job. I would never quit my job. Now, if the job was garbage, yes. But if I'm doing this... All right. And I won $80 million. I'm not quitting this. I'd be like, praise the Lord. We're set. How do we buy a building? <laughs> All right. No. But apply. And a lot of times we don't understand what God has given us and we don't know how to apply it. Okay. So that God would strengthen our inner man with his might is one of the things he's given us, all right? To strengthen our inner man. What is the inner man? It's our spirit inside us, okay? It's the spirit. We have the external, which is the carnal, which is always at war with the internal, but the inner man would be strengthened. In the Greek, it's the word dunamis, dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, dunamis. Anybody want to take a guess what two English words come from it? Dynamic and dynamite. Dynamic and dynamite come from that Greek word. It is the Greek word for power, not just any type of power, controlled power. That's why dynamite is a controlled explosion. 
You put enough C4 in something, you can blow it just right. All right. So controlled power, dynamic controlled power. All right. So the Lord teaches us that the inner man can have dunamis power, controlled power by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, to understand this better, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. All right. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And we're going to Acts chapter 1. Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Again, that same power, dunamis power, dynamic power, power that is controlled. What will happen? We will receive that power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, and we will be witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all Samaria. So we're not currently in Jerusalem, right, or in the Middle East. So how do we put this into application? Again, this is really cool. It's like awesome. He'll give us dynamic power, dynamite power, dunamis power. How do I apply it? That would be like going, okay, here's some C4. Make sure that that wall comes out. If you put too much C4, what will happen? You're taking the wall plus the other wall. You put too little C4, you're just going to make a hole. That's why combat engineers in the military taught how much to put exactly on a door to blow out the door. All right. The controlled power. It's a controlled explosion. So the way you look at it is we are called to be witnesses of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, that controlled power that he gives us in Jerusalem. So what is your Jerusalem? Where is your Jerusalem? Anyone know? There you go. It's right here. You're standing in it. All right. Or sitting in it. So it's Oceanside. Oceanside is your Jerusalem right now. You are here. If you're watching online, and you are in, let's say, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee is your Jerusalem, okay? So it's here. The Judea would be the outer area. So our Judea would be like Vista, Escondido, San Marcos, the North County area. That's our Judea. Does this sound familiar about targeted prayer? Same concepts, going from the in to the out. All right, same thing. You start centralized here by power functioning and you go outboard. Okay. And then it says to Samaria. So uh, Samaria would push even further. Samaria would get, go Northern Pendleton, would go into San Clemente, would go towards Riverside, would do all that. That would be the area. And then the other parts of the earth is going out. So the thing is, a lot of places, they don't want to function like that. They don't want to start within their own community, how to impact their community by the gospel, by this power. And it can start right in your home. And they want to be well known everywhere else. And there lies the problem. That's not how this works. Okay. You start where you're at. So again, getting that same power that we receive through the Holy Spirit. Turn to Isaiah in the Old, the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to look at verses 29 through 31. If you're not there, I'm going to read it. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth uh, shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Uh, I said away 31, right? But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All right. And we've heard this verse before. And a lot of people quote it, but they don't recognize again the power here that it's talking about. He gives power to the weak. What did Paul say later in Philippians? When I am weak, he is strong. So he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases the strength. When you're weak, he'll give you more. All right? And that's what you understand. It's nothing you do. It's everything the Lord does. Look at the next chapter, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, 
For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All right? So the Lord does the work in us. If you feel weak and that you cannot make it or do it, all right, ask God for this power. All you have to do. God, I need your power and your strength. It's easy when we're sitting at home. It's easy when things are going smooth and we're in a routine. It's really difficult when you're stuck in the Detroit airport for hours on end. All right? So, trust me, I was praying. Lord, don't let me get arrested and banned off the flight. So, so all right? Oh. So, again, if you feel weak, ask God for this power. All right? So the reality is this. Here's the reality. I must ask the Lord to give me this power to do ministry. I cannot do ministry on my own accord. On my own accord? <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. That's what I'm going to tell you. You're like, whoa, what? Up with that dude. All right. <laughs> I need God's power to do this. It's the only way I can do it. It's the only way I can do the ministry. There's no other way. There is no other way to do this. You can't do it by your own power. To to be able to teach, it's by his power. By the to be able to do counseling, it's by his power. To do anything, it's by his power. Even dealing with all the craziness that comes with stuff. It's all by his power, right? So it is by the power of the Holy Spirit we overcome sin. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit we overcome temptation. It's the same power that will help you overcome sin and temptation. So if you're like, man, I'm getting my butt handed to me in this area, you're not letting the Lord put his power in there to overcome it. You want to do it. And a lot of people have that attitude. They're like, well, I'll just, I got to do my part. Do your part. What part? That's like, that would be like this. That would be like if God was going to pick up a massive giant weight and you're like, I have to do my part. And your part is like two fingers going. Eh. And that there's nothing there. He's doing the whole thing. He's the one who has to do it in you. It's the only way to overcome this. All right. It's the only way you overcome sin and temptation by the power of the Holy Spirit. This control power, dunamis power. It is the only way to do it. There's no other way. You can't do it. You want, you want to overcome issues in your life? It's by dunamis power, the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? It is the only way to do it, all right? So, overcome sin, overcome temptation. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is this. I want you to know, just like Paul, okay, my prayer is that you will all know this as well, what we're talking about, and that you will walk and apply this in your lives just like I do. That's my hope for you and my prayer for you. Because so many people are being beat up all the time because they don't let the Lord take control. They want to be in control. All right? You know, they want to be in control. And unfortunately, you're not in control. All right? You're not in control. So, we think we're in control, right? But... We never had control. It's the problem that we all come across. And we negotiate with God or we try to do other things and it never works. You cannot do it no matter how much you think you can. Not going to happen. Not going to happen at all. The Lord has to do it. The Lord has to do it in you to give you his power. Discouragement sets in. And then what? It has to be done by his power. Frustration sets in. Has to be done by his power, right? Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. You have to trust the Lord through it. It's not easy, right? It's easy sometimes to hear this from here. And like I said, when everything's going well, I'm like, amen, that's right. And when things go wrong, then what? Then what? It's still amen, yes. Okay, the third thing tonight, right? So going back to Ephesians real quick. Back there. So again, 
here. He's talking about praying on his knees. Verse 15, from whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened in the might through the spirit of the inner man we talked about, that Christ may dwell, may dwell in your hearts through faith. Let's talk about dwelling. Dwell in your hearts through faith. So the word dwell in Greek is the word, uh, kat- I'm going to butcher this, kateo. Keo. It's spelled K-A-T-O-I-K-E-O. Let me say it again. Say that three times fast. K-A-T-O-I-K-E-O. All right. It means to dwell as in to settle. To dwell as in to settle. So this is, again, this is not, let's use it in the context of you. This is not you staying in a hotel. That is a temporary dwelling. You either there for a day, two days, a week, and you're out. When you stay in a hotel and you've been in a hotel too long, when you first get to the hotel, everyone's like, ooh, this is nice. When it's a really nice hotel, they have a spa, they have a pool, they have this. And it's all fun, right? <clears throat> Until you've been there for a week and usually what do you feel like? I want to go to sleep in my bed. <laughs> I want to go home. Because you're not dwelling in the hotel. It's a temporary stay. It's just fun. It's the same going to stay with family. You get there and you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in years. You're going to have the kids. Lovely, 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 lovely. Pictures, 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 pictures. But by the time you're all done staying with family, what's in your, what's in your mind? I want to go home. And it all depends how your family is too. It could be like a rotten egg. But even if it's like the sweetest, nicest person and they just know how to make the most beautiful Kringles. You guys ever read a Kringle? Yeah. The most beautiful Kringles for breakfast and the best coffee. And they do eggs and bacon and biscuits and gravy. (laughs) Even though it sounds really good. After, even if you stay for three weeks, eventually you will be, I want to go home. I want to, I want to be where I'm supposed to be dwelling. All right. That's what happens. And no matter what, when I went to the East coast, we drove to Pennsylvania and we looked at property and we drove back. My wife had to fly back early. By the time I was hitting California and we had to stay one more night in Merced, I realized my back can't take anymore. I want to go home. My friend is really cool. I love him. And I was supposed to go on to uh, Modesto, California, and that got canceled. And so I remember we're like, all right, we're just going to go early. Me and Arell started driving home, and we saw the Anaheim State, and we looked at each other and went, because <laughs> we knew we were only about 40 minutes from the house. <laughs> so, Cause we both wanted to go home. We realized we were gone for a month for a month. All right. It's and it, and when you're young, it's all fun, but when you get older, it's not as fun anymore. And I think this is where the military have a hard time. Okay. This is where they struggle a little bit when you're married and you're in the military. Cause my whole career, I was married. I was married at 18 years old, joined at 19, married with a kid. Married 25 years, yes to the same woman. For some of you don't know, there's always one person that's like, to the same woman? Yes, to the same woman. All right? It's always been a home because she's with me. But you have to factor, think about some of these young men and women. They join the military. They leave home to live in the barracks. And they struggle to realize that's your home. Some of them have even told me that's my prison cell. <laughs> All right? And the thing is, if you're joining the military and you're on a four or five year contract, or if you were the, I almost said it, but I'm not going to say it. You were the special one to sign the legacy one for six years for Lance Corporal, which is not worth it. All right. Hopefully no one in the room did. All right. You realize you're six years in the barracks. If you live in the barracks, unless you move out or gain rain, move out or get married. But that becomes your home. And some Marines and sailors and soldiers and everyone who lives in the barracks, we can't have airmen because they all get hotels. But I'm just kidding. But they all, they all have to make it their home. And it's really easy when the barracks is really nice. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Some of you do. But when the, when the barracks is not. And, and this generation gets the barracks. Rewind the clock even before I joined. All right? And you live in a squad bay. In your little corner of your cot, 
is your home possibly for the next three years. All right. So it's very, very different. Okay. To dwell. It means that you're settling, you're staying. Okay. It's made up of two words. Kata. K-A-T-A. All right. It means down from, down from, and oike. O-I-K-E-O, which means to dwell in. So down from to dwell in. Okay? Down from the dwelling. So notice what it's saying here in this. That Christ may dwell in your heart. Come down in, dwell in. Okay? This would talk about the Holy Spirit living in us. Come down and dwell in us. So the root word again, coming down, but this root word also of oikos, oikos means house. All right? house or inhabited house or a home okay so paul's prayer is that the lord would make our hearts his home that's the key that you are his home this is why jesus says in in the gospel of john that if you abide in him and him in you he says we the father son Holy spirit will dwell with you Dwell with you. You have a relationship. They'll dwell with you. Okay? So, again, Paul's prayer that the, it would be the Lord's home. Okay? So, Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit living inside with our spirit. So, here's the question for you tonight. Okay? Does Christ feel at home in your heart? Let me say it again. Does Christ feel at home in your heart? All right, which brings up the question, this, all right, brings up this question. If the Lord is living in you, do you see and feel the changes? That's the most important thing. There are a lot of people who say, yes, I'm a Christian. I have Jesus, and there's zero changes. They're drunk every weekend. They still get high. They sleep around. They do crazy things, but they claim they're Christians. That's not Christianity. You can't be born into Christianity. You have to be born again into Christianity. That's what John chapter 3 is all about. See, we all know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever uh, believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But, but he's talking to Nicodemus, and then he goes, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, do I need to go back into my mother's womb? And he goes, you being a teacher of the law do not understand spiritual heavenly things? You have to be born of water, of water and of the Spirit. You have to be born again. All right? So if you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. So what does this mean? It means this. If you are only born physically, but you do not have Jesus, you will die twice. You will die a physical death, and you will go to the lake of fire, which is the second death. Not annihilationism, where all of a sudden, poof, you're gone. It's eternal being in there, which is called the second death. But if you're born twice, born physically, and born again by the Spirit of God, when you ask Christ to come in your life, you only die a physical death, and you'll live on eternally. But Paul says in Corinthians, behold, a mystery I give you. We will not all die, but in a twinkling and of an eye, we'll be transformed. Talking about the rapture, the, the, the generation of the body of Christ that gets raptured will never taste death. They will instantaneously go into eternity being transformed into perfection. All right? So Christ living in us, that there would be a real change. And the question you have to ask too is, do others see the change? Because a lot of people deceive themselves. Oh, yeah, I'm changing. I'm changing. But they don't really change. And there are other people who don't see it. So... Have you ever had this happen to you? All right. And it's happened to me. Because I told you before, I could tell you Bible stories. I was going to church. I grew up in the church. And when I was in the Marine Corps, I'd tell you I'm a Christian. And I remember one time my gunny goes, you go to church? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, man, I would have never suspected. Yeah. You? Because my conduct was horrible. <laughs> so. Now. But do they see the change in you? And have you seen the change? 
Sometimes the Lord changes things overnight, and sometimes it takes years to change. But the change will come, all right? It happens. If you say yes, that the Lord lives in me, and you continue to live in sin, you have to ask this question. Does he really live in my heart? Because he doesn't. If you can sin and have no guilt about your sin, you don't have Jesus. I'm going to tell you like that. And if you like to sin and you like to live in that sin, you don't have Jesus. You don't. You're lying to yourself if you do. You don't. If you hate people, you don't have Jesus. This is not my words. This is the Lord's. The Bible says in 1 John, how can you hate your brother who you do see and love God who you don't see? You're a liar and the truth's not in you. You cannot hate people and say you love God. You can't hate people and say you have Jesus. It's impossible. It's impossible. Anyone who teaches a different Jesus does not have Jesus. They are cursed. They're athema. They're cursed. If you teach a different Jesus. This is again, 1 John. You cannot say, oh yeah, I'm all about Jesus, but there's some aspects that I leave out that are convenient for me. It doesn't work that way. The Bible's not a buffet. You don't get to take what you want. It's the whole council or nothing. All right? That's how it works. That's why we go verse by verse, precept on precept. We don't skip anything. So it all goes in. You deal with it. We can't just take one piece and that piece. There are places like that that will cater to that. Where you will come in and they'll be like, Jesus loves you and everything goes well and he gets you and everybody deserves a Big Mac and let's all have a Big Mac together. Kumbaya. And that's all they get. And it's, it's called the social gospel. Jesus gets you. Jesus loves you. But there's no repentance. There's no turn to Christ and repent. All right. It's not work-based. You can't work your way to heaven. A lot of people get stuck in tradition of works. And they do all these good deeds thinking, if I do enough good deeds, God will get it. There's nothing wrong with doing good stuff. And there's nothing wrong with helping your neighbor and helping the poor. But it doesn't bring salvation. Salvation and repentance is not, I'm helping the sick and the naked and the poor so God can see I'm a good boy or a good girl. That's not it. It doesn't work that way. All right? It has to do with he deals with your heart. When he deals with your heart and he truly transforms your heart, then you will help people, but it will be for the right motives, all right? Because the Bible warns about when you help people or you do stuff for recognition, you already got your reward. But when you do it without recognition, then God will give you the reward in heaven. So remember this. Again, Christ living in our heart, changing us, transforming us, all right? To dwell in us. It's the thing. When he dwells in us, then the power comes. That's the Holy Spirit. Then that power comes, all right? So, here's the thing, okay? I asked the question, does he really live in my heart? So the Lord wants to take up permanent residency in your life. He wants to take up permanent residency in your life. He doesn't want to be temporary. He's not checking in like it's a hotel. He wants to be the ruler of your life and take up permanency. He wants to show you everything he can give you and what he can do for your life. And if you take all your dreams, all your goals, everything that you were hoping to do, and you give it to him, he'll come up with the best plan for you. Because what you may think you really want, you may discover, I don't really want this anymore. Because when we look at the things of the world and how they go, we get excited about things of the world. And then it's over. Okay, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Who likes sports? We got football, baseball, these different sports, right? And basketball. Track, all these sports. Okay. So let's use, let's, let's look at this for a minute. You have, you have the biggest... You have the biggest sports like the NFL with the Super Bowl. You got baseball, World Series, playoffs. You got the World Cup where everyone goes crazy. You have all these sports. So they, there's these big events. We, we cheer for our teams, right? So one of the biggest events is the World Cup. The World Cup, we go wild, right? 
But, but we go, wow, we got the jerseys, we paint our faces, we got everything, we got our boards, we're like, wow, we're at the stadium, we're going wild. So now, here's the thing. Imagine, right now we got the Padres playing right now against the Dodgers. Okay, easy, easy. <laughs> Never take her to the movies. So, all right, now, here's my point. Listen, listen, listen. All right, y'all got distracted like this. Pay attention. All right. You got this big game going on. Everyone, if you've been watching the footage, is going wild down at the stadium, right? Because they're all like, y'all, the Padres, oh, they did it. They're going nuts, right? Okay. Now, here's the thing. They're going crazy on this, and, and all the emotions are there. Everything's happening, and you connect this way, and it's exciting, and all that goes on, right? And it's all, it's all temporary. Because next season, there's going to be a new game, and the next team's going to win it, and the Padres may not do well. The Padres may do well again. But now imagine you have this super emotional high. You've connected. There's been screaming and yelling. Everyone's going crazy. You're talking about, man, could you believe it? Blah, 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 blah. The game's over. The next day you go there, there's nobody in the stadium, and you start doing the cheers again, and you start like trying to get all worked up and, and you even try to rush the field like the crowd did. And you're like, wow, nothing's happening. That is the same thing in religion. Just so you're aware. What happens is people get so worked up emotionally in religion. All right. And then they try to do it again and again to realize that's not how this works. And that's workspace. See that just as the game is temporary for the Padres or any other soccer game, or football game, even if, even if you made it to the playoffs, even if Sean being a coach, or Ronnie who was a football coach, his team went to the Super Bowl, or they, they did the whole state championship, whatever it is, right? In that moment, the state championship, like, we're married at, and they're crying at each other, they're like, ah, oh, another word. And then what? Because guess what happens in the fall season? Start all over again. Let's use another example. Marine Corps boot camp. You go through all the wear and tear of three months. You go through craziness and the pain and getting screamed at and yelled at and everything to make it through the crucible to get your ear glowing anchor and all the new Marines are crying because they made it. It's emotional. And you finally made it to graduation. And guess what happens in a few weeks? Right back to left, right. <laughs> Because there's just a bunch of recruits can't do anything. The emotions go. And it's all temporary. But the thing is about what Jesus does is eternal. And so we, we, we connect in these things here. We understand it. But it's eternal where it's heading. It's eternal. And that what I'm getting at is that Christ living in us, Christ working in us, and that he would continue to live in us and that he wants to take up all of it. And there's more excitement than that and where you're going, where you can take any Marine, any sailor, soldier, airman, you can take any football coach, basketball coach, track coach, any multi-billionaire, millionaire, lawyer, business owner, entrepreneur has all the toys. And if they learn in Christ real quick, there is more excitement to the ministry then there isn't gaining worldly things. It's all temporary. And if you let Christ dwell on you permanently, because he's not going to leave you, but he takes the permanent residency like you let him have in the control, you'll have exciting a life. When you, who's read a good missionary book? You got The Peace Child, Through the Gates of Splendor, Bruch Co. You have about Amy Carmichael. You have, you have the Jesus Revolution movie that came out about Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel, Nikki Cruz. You have all these stories of people who became either amazing, amazing pastors, evangelists, missionaries, gone through incredible stories. You got Jeremy Camp, and they made a movie about his life and what he went through. You have all these stories, but it's because the Lord got a hold of their life and transformed their life. And then we look at it and we go, whoa, that's amazing what Jesus does. But they let the Lord take control to go where they needed to go for the whole thing. That they would discover that the Lord had a plan for their life. And if you will do that and let the Lord take control of your life to be permanently in charge, where you're going is completely exciting. 
It will be a challenge. You will find things very different. You will learn to let go of the things of this world, but you will discover it will be the most exciting time. I remember my own life coming home, doing the ministry. I was still active duty. I was learning to be a pastor and I'm driving home. And I shared this with you guys before and before the, the, the Naval Hospital was built where it is, you could really see out to the ocean. It was such a beautiful day. The sun just bouncing off the water. I'm driving home and I discovered I was more excited about doing ministry than I was about the Marine Corps. And I was ready to let go of the Marine Corps. I, I really liked the Marine Corps. It's a, it's a beautiful love-hate relationship for anyone who's been in it. In any branch of service, there's days you wake up and you're like, man, we're getting paid to do this? I'm getting paid to use this kind of weapons or do this? Or I remember being in boot camp and recruits are like, oh, we got to run. And I'm like, dude, we're getting paid to work out. That's all we do all day is work out. We are getting a paycheck to look good and work out. <laughs> That's how I saw it. All you had to do was scream as loud as you could. It's like Forrest Gump, man. All you had to do is scream as loud as you could. Do what they told you. Because you told me to do this instructor. He says, all you do is do what they told you. Go to chow. Take apart your weapon. Put it back together. Move as fast as you can. Be even louder. Go to chow again. Go to sleep. They told you. And I was like, wow, we're getting paid to do this? And then there were days I woke up. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. Because you realize tomorrow was zero dark, 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 early PT. And you're just, I don't want to. Just to forget, oh, I'm on a 96. I don't have to do that. It's great. So, you know, my point is, my point is, is that from that relationship to the ministry, it got exciting because Jesus took full control. And if you'll let Jesus take full control, you'll discover how exciting life can get and where you're going. You just have to let him. If you don't let him, You'll never discover it. You, you'll never discover where you can go. And what we'll do, every missionary that has an incredible story, they let Jesus take control. Let the Lord take control and see where he takes you. You may be really surprised. There may not be a book about your life, but there's a record in heaven about what you're doing. And so trust the Lord through those things and where you're going to go. Listen, yeah, this is going to be a two-parter. I don't want to get into the next part yet. I, I want to I end here because the next one's got a lot to look at with it as well. So I want to end tonight with, with this, and I'll take questions online. So if you're listening online, just start typing your questions, or if you're in the room, you can ask them again. It's the two things I really want you to take away. If you let Jesus take full control of your life and you obey him, you will know real power. Real power. And guess who doesn't want you to know that? There you go. The devil, enemy. Because he knows in the minute you know that, that real power, you overcome. You'll overcome sin, temptation, your marriage will change. Everything will change. The way you see everything will radically change. And you will have victory like you've never seen. And in the midst of all the trial, you will still have victory. And that's the key. Let the Lord take control of your life. Amen? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. I pray that, um, Lord, you would just help us to walk strong in you. I pray if there's anyone here tonight who's struggling in this area that you would um, help them, Lord, that they would surrender their life, Lord, and that they would just know that you have what's best for them, that there would be no fear in this. And, and the enemy comes and lies. I want you all to know this. The enemy comes and lies and will, will tell you things like, if you do this, you'll be poor or you'll have nothing or he lies. What you need to understand is the Lord has the best plan for your life. So I pray right now, if there's anyone tonight struggling in this area, that they would surrender. I pray for those who are hurting and sick, that you would heal them, Lord. And Lord, we pray for the marriages, that you would keep them strong. I pray that each person tonight would examine their life and surrender the areas of their life that they're struggling. And Lord, that they would really know that they're being transformed and changed. In Jesus' name, amen.